Okay, welcome to Biology 2401, Human Anatomy and Physiology 1. So let's get started. All right, so boring stuff. Uh, your syllabus is on Blackboard, as are your lectures. Um, we'll hit some of the high points here on your syllabus and then move on from there. You need a book. Um, the textbook companies and I are no longer friends. I found it ridiculous that your textbook used to cost $300. Luckily, um, OpenStax, which is an initiative from Rice University that publishes free textbooks online, uh, made an anatomy and physiology book available, and it's free. You download it, it's online, you can print it out if you want. If you really need a copy, you can, you can order it. It's not expensive, and it's equivalent to any other anatomy text. The good thing about anatomy text is they're all fairly equivalent. So if you've already got one from a friend or previous semester, as long as it's relatively recent, you'll be fine. I'm not saying that you can use like Gray's Anatomy from the 1800s or whatever, that's not gonna be very helpful, but anything that's like in the last five, six years, you'll be fine. So if you have an old edition or something that you've got, I'm not worried about it. Anatomy books are reference books. It's not something that you sit down and read listen to when you're driving unless you want to fall asleep and die they're reference books you go back and you reference them so i'm not going to be assigning you readings i don't expect for you to read through the whole book i'm going to be asking you questions out of the book the book is there as a reference for you so it's really not conducive to your financial financial condition to go spend 300 bucks on one when it's free online. So yeah, you're welcome. Um, so officially you have to go to class, but it's online. So what do I care? Uh, there is no formal class time. You don't have to show up for formal class things. Uh, I'll be available virtually throughout the semester. Uh, your syllabus has my, my cell number. You can text me, you can email me. We can meet whatever you need, but there is no formal class time where you have to show up together as a group on a giant Brady Punch Zoom meeting or whatever. Um, so yeah, I know you've got other stuff going on. So you're working. So if you're working in the healthcare field, you're freaking busy. Um, last semester, I, I held like a one Zoom meeting and I had four nurses that were gathered around one computer in the break room at the hospital and they all took their break so they could sit through a Zoom meeting. So I, I don't have a, a specific time where you have to be there. We're asynchronous as it were. Your lectures, you should find on YouTube. Hopefully you found this one on YouTube. If you subscribe to the YouTube channel, you'll be able to keep up with the lectures as they go up. I'm reworking some of the things this semester. So while you may see videos from past semester, I'm not saying that they're ridiculous or unhelpful. It would be to your benefit to keep up with the more recent ones as I may have added material or subtracted material. Also, tell your friends, like and subscribe below, whatever. Um, I need like a, a hundred thousand likes so I can make some money. I got like five kids. Give me a break. All right. So your grade, you've got eight exams, four lecture exams, four lab practicals. The lecture exams are 70% of your grade. The lab practicals is 30% of your grade. The exams will pop up on Blackboard according to the dates that are on your syllabus. I'll have them posted there. Answer the questions. Whatever. So here's the deal with exams. I know you're concerned about this. First of all, I hate proctoring software. I feel like it's an invasion of privacy. I feel like you having a camera in your house, room, car, wherever you are, 
and having to pan around the room and constantly move stuff and having something that monitors your eye movements. I feel like that's invasive. I don't think it's fair for you to be judged on how often you move your eyes during an exam. So we won't be using any of the proctoring software. There's that. So what you're thinking right now is yes, this is easy. I'm going to cheat my way through this class. Rock on, man. Um, you do you. But the thing is, is to compensate for that, because I, I know that how this works. I'm not stupid, right? As I mentioned, I've got I've got five kids. I know what online classes look like. You're not going to find any of my questions on Quizlet. And they tend to be difficult, multi-part things that you have to synthesize the information that you know, put the pieces together to solve the puzzle. And if you have to look some of that up and you have to go back and reference your notes or what we've talked about, that's great because that's what you would do in real life. At no point in your professional career are you going to be faced with the problem that you don't know the answer to and you just have to guess? You will go ask or you will look it up. So that's actually part of the difficulty now is you being able not just to remember the information, but to be able to find the information if you don't remember and then be able to use that information practically. And that's not something you can Google that sort of critical thinking skill you're not going to find online. That's the tough part now. Before that, the tough part used to be really just, you know, memorizing the different things, understanding those processes and committing them to memory. Now, since you sort of have that external source, you don't have to commit that to memory. So now the difficult part is the critical thinking. In essence, your, your exams are open book, which does not make them easier. Something I learned when I was a teaching assistant at Texas Tech, a biology professor there, was that making a test open book actually makes it considerably harder. And to prove a point, he gave a class an open book exam and the rest of their exams had not been open book. And you could see, uh, I think their average went down by at least 10 points because they didn't bother studying the information. They thought they would just look it up. And it was one of these things where you can't look up critical thinking. You're still going to need to learn this. Just because you can Google some of them doesn't mean that you don't need to know it. So there's my exam speech or whatever. All right, so AMP, AMP is hard, I know. You've heard, this sucks. Um, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of words. It's not the only thing you've got going on. This may be the first science -y thing you've seen in a while. The thing is, if you're planning on going into nursing or medicine, it's just the application of this stuff. A lot of people see anatomy and physiology as sort of the hurdle you have to get past. And once you get over that, you can, you can get into nursing school. And once you get over that, you can get into whatever program you're looking at. That's not how this works. This is not a hurdle. It's a step. You don't get over it. You build on it. If you hate this or you suck at it, you need to really consider your career path because nursing is just the application of this stuff. Medicine is just the application of this. This is the foundation for all your healthcare related stuff because it's, you know, your body. Keep that in mind as we go through the semester. So now science, what you were waiting for the whole time. Before we do that, obviously read your syllabus, your schedules online, it's on Blackboard. All your stuff, announcements, et cetera, will be on Blackboard. So let's start, anatomy and physiology. 
Anatomy is the study of structures and how they relate to one another. We'll look at cellular anatomy and we'll work all the way up to organisms, cells and tissues and organs. Physiology is the function of those parts and the processes that are involved to maintain life. While you may see other colleges that separate these two ideas and you have a semester of anatomy and a semester of physiology, those two concepts are really difficult to separate because they are essential to one another. All anatomy is the result of physiology. At the same time, all physiology is made possible by anatomy. In other words, things are where they are because that's where they need to be for your body to work right. Let's talk about an example. All right, so uh, this, this book is uh, Anesthesia for Congenital Heart Disease. Um, the kid in the center there, the, the baby with all the tubes coming out of him, that is Bennett. Um, Bennett was born with a congenital heart defect. It's called transposition of the great arteries. And two big arteries come off the top of the heart. The uh, aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And Bennett, those two vessels were reversed. So his heart was pumping high oxygen blood back to his lungs and low oxygen blood out to his body. They had to uh, surgically correct that. And that's what you see there is him pre-op at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. Um, surgery was done when he was six days old. And with that correction, they went back and reversed those two arteries as well as the coronary arteries that feed the heart itself. And, and he's good. I, good is relative, he's healthy. Um, he's six now and he's my youngest and super demanding. But that's this unity of form and function. When there's an anatomical issue, you get a physiological issue. Bennett's issue with his heart was strictly anatomical, but that completely disrupted physiology. So those two ideas are dependent on one another. So let's talk about anatomy as a science. Anatomy is one of the older sciences that we have a record of, um, at least as early as 600, excuse me, 1600 BC. We see the Edwin Smith surgical papyrus there. It identifies the heart as the center of all body fluid supply. So the Egyptians were, you know, mummifying people and taking organs out and putting them in jars for keeping later. They, they tried, but they sucked at it. They couldn't figure out where stuff came from, like sweat, saliva. They had no clue on that one. Um, and they were pretty sure that the only important organ in your body was the heart and the liver to a lesser degree. Um, you see those four jars there, you got like the heart, the liver, the kidneys and stuff would go in those. The brain, they just threw out. Screw that. It's irrelevant. For some reason, the Greeks decided to name everything. So most of the anatomical terms we have will either be Latin or Greek in origin. A lot of the credit for medical studies in the fourth century came from Hippocrates. Whether he is deserving of that credit or not is debatable. But Hippocrates is the father of medicine. The first physician to reject supernatural forces as the cause of illness. Before Hippocrates, if you got sick, it's because God was mad at you. You must have done something wrong to deserve that. Leprosy? Yeah. What did you do? Because God's mad and you earned it. Hippocrates came along and said, you know what? No, it's not a punishment. There's something environmental causing this. 
Now, Hippocrates did work under the idea of something called humorism, which was that you had four fluids in your body, black and yellow bile, phlegm and blood, and in balancing those fluids or humors was the uh, essence of being healthy. So we would try to balance those out. Now, we'll talk about this momentarily, but that idea stuck around until the mid 1800s. It's uh, not a, like a scientific idea, but because Hippocrates thought of it, we kept it. It's not helpful. Um, this led to the practice of bloodletting, which again is not helpful. But more on that idea of, of dogma and science in a bit. Still in the fourth century BC, we have Aristotle there. Aristotle was dissecting animals, different animals, comparing them. He's the father of comparative anatomy. We take different things and compare the organs inside. Um, Aristotle did think that the heart was the center of all consciousness. There's Praxagoras, an ancient Greek physician who identified the difference between arteries and veins. The first real school of anatomy was in Alexandria, modern day Cairo, from about 300 to somewhere in the second century BC. Um, late in the fourth century BC, we saw the first use of cadavers to study anatomy. And a guy named Herophilus, uh, who's now the father of anatomy, was allegedly granted permission to perform vivisections on condemned prisoners in Alexandria. Now, a vivisection is when you dissect something while it's still alive. Father of anatomy, mass murderer psychopath. But it was for science, so it's okay-ish for science. We learned a lot from dissecting people that were still alive. We learned that the heart was not where consciousness was. I don't actually know how, I can guess. The actual uh, works of Herophilus would be lost when the library in Alexandria burned in 272 AD, but before it was lost, those works of Herophilus were used to write the first anatomy book. Around 150 AD, a guy named Galen wrote the first real anatomy text. Galen was the physician to the gladiators in Rome. So he was able to study severe injuries and wounds without actually dissecting anyone. They were, you know, dissecting themselves. Um, he determined the functions of organs by performing vivisections on animals. There he is, I believe, vivisecting a pig. So, I mean, it's not a person, so slightly less psychotic than its predecessor. Here's where stuff gets weird. So during medieval times, we stopped studying stuff. Galen had written this down. We don't have a printing press yet. So if you need this, you had to copy it down by hand. It's going to be in Latin. And it was pretty much understood that everything that could be known about the body, Galen had figured out. So, I mean... Why bother? Just read what that dude wrote. If you can read, which you probably can't. So we turned away from science. A lot of you went back to the idea that diseases were supernatural. Here you see uh, one of the plagues, which was considered to be both environmental and supernatural. And we had this general rejection of, of scientific thought, which sent us really back and far back in terms of medical studies. Luckily, that can't ever happen again. Uh, I mean, if you don't count right now. If you don't count right now, we're golden. Right now, not a great time for this whole science thing. Kind of taking a beating at the moment. So public service announcement, science doesn't care about your feelings. 
Science doesn't care about anything but data. If you don't have data, if you don't understand the science, stop talking. If you don't know how that vaccine works, nobody cares about your opinion. Science isn't based on uh, opinions. When we say opinion in science, what we mean is someone who has the data and is drawing a conclusion from that data. It's not just how they feel about it. So around 1020 AD, a guy named Avicenna, a Persian physician, wrote the canon of medicine. Basically, he took the works of Galen, sort of extrapolated on that. And the only reason we know the works of Galen exist uh, is because they survived through the works of Aunt, uh, Avicenna. Fun part. This was the anatomical book until the 1600s. So let's say in this time period, like, you know, 150 or so AD, like 1600 AD, somewhere in there, you want to be a doctor. Now, doctor is not what it is now. You weren't going to be super highly respected. You were a necessity and people were just as likely to go to like a spiritual healer or herbalist or witch doctor or crazy lady in the woods as you but you want to be a doctor you're going to do this for some reason well your medical training is going to include theology so religion Astrology, you definitely need to know that astrology because that matters somehow. And probably some magic. You're going to learn some spells because you might need to summon a demon or ban a demon or some of that crap. Is it going to help? No, not at all. If you're lucky, you'll get some anatomical education, and that will be based on the canon of medicine, more likely than not, or if it's far enough back, the works of Galen. Now, in these works, you will find anatomical studies, probably written in Latin, and based on the anatomy of dogs. So for 1,500 years, doctors learned to practice medicine based on the anatomy of dogs. And they maintain the principle of humorism. So they would bleed you. Doctors would learn how to stare at your urine and see if they thought something was wrong. So if you want to go to your anatomy lab, yeah, you're not doing that. That's not really a thing. So you don't get to dissect a cadaver like doctors would today. You would go watch it maybe depending on like the time frame we're talking about, like past like 1300 or so, you might go watch this, but you're not gonna do it. The professor that's teaching the class also not going to do that because it's beneath him. It's gonna be dissected by a barber. Why? I, I honestly don't know why they pick barbers. I really do think it's because, I mean, they've already got a razor. Just start cutting, wipe it off and give somebody a shave. About cutting. So it's your class, your anatomy class. You got you and a few other idiots who are going to be doctors. You're standing around trying not to get the plague and watching this guy tell a barber to hack up a dead guy who was probably executed for something stupid. So the professor might actually be the only one who can read this stupid book that he's got and is telling the barber how to cut. And he tells the barber to find some structure. If the barber can't find it, the professor will get angry and try to find it. He may not be able to find it either. If that's the case, well, obviously there's something wrong with the body or the barber screwed up. So it's not the book's fault. But it was actually, the book was wrong. Dogs and people aren't the same inside. And, and Galen and vicariously Avicenna made lots of assumptions about how physiology worked. One of the major ones was that the brain somehow got the better blood 
and the rest of the body got this lesser blood. For that to work, your heart chambers would have to be connected to one another. You wouldn't have four separate chambers. So for 1,500 years, doctors would swear they could find the opening between the heart chambers during this dissection thing. If they couldn't, like you're like, I don't see a hole there. They're like, sorry, you're not a doctor. Go back to being a present. Go find a job or whatever. So you're like, oh, never mind. I found the hole. Yeah, that's right. Now you're a doctor. Nobody would challenge the textbook because it was written by Galen. And, and who are you? You're some like peasant off the street who decided he wanted to be a doctor. Find the freaking hole because Galen said it would be there. It wasn't until around 1530 AD, a guy named Vesalius, who was called the father of modern anatomy, graduated medical school. He graduated medical school, he's brilliant. They immediately offered him the chair of surgery at his school. He began teaching surgeons, um, performing the dissections himself because he didn't need a barber. And he tried to get the students to participate, hands on observation. He was the first person to point out that Galen had substituted dog anatomy for people anatomy. I mean, maybe they knew, but nobody's gonna challenge it. And he's like, you know, that's a dog that he's talking about. Well, there, evidently prior to him, nobody even noticed. They sucked as doctors is what it amounted to. Um, Vesalius admitted that he could not find the opening between the ventricles because they don't exist. So Vesalius, the first famous doctor, royal physician, great guy. Hit the 1600s, 1700s, at the printing press, and now anatomy is a big thing. It's a legit science. It's not just a bunch of crazy people cutting out bodies. They would have public dissections. Um, cities like Amsterdam would sell freaking tickets and refreshments and merchandise trailers or whatever, buy a t-shirt and a Coke and sit around and watch some guy get cut up. It's a good time. So a Renaissance fair for anatomy geeks in the Renaissance. Artists like Michelangelo and Rembrandt would, would attend these dissections and make drawings and, and cash in. A lot of these uh, old master painting guys, like they didn't sell paintings when they were alive. It was really hard to sell a giant like fresco or whatever. I know very little about art, um, but the anatomical drawings like cash in, like that's cash. Universities could teach anatomy. You can't read Latin, there's a drawing. Here's anatomical study of the arm by Da Vinci, 1510. You see that backwards Da Vinci writing. This is uh, the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp by Rembrandt. Dr. Tulp was the mayor of Amsterdam and an anatomist. And so here he's invited all these nicely bearded gentlemen to come and uh, watch him cut up this dead dude. Super popular event. Those guys probably paid like 10 bucks a head to be there and see them making notes. They've never seen this before. Italy was a big hub of anatomical study. Um, with permission, you could actually dissect women in Italy, which you couldn't do anywhere else. Now, once we hit the 1800s, we started getting a lot more anatomical texts being published. Lots of people are wanting to be doctors now. A doctor was becoming more of a, more of a respected career. Now, doctors as we know it didn't become like this super respected career till well into the 1900s, but you started to gain some respect here and people are wanting to be doctors. But we stopped executing so many people. Before this, I mean, still a pig, they'd execute you. You've seen like Pirates of the Caribbean where they're just executing hundreds of people. When you hit the 1800s, we stopped doing that. I don't know if we were running out of people, but something happened. But the demand for cadavers to dissect had gone on quite a bit. So in response to that, 
we created a little cottage industry called body snatching. So they would go and dig up the bodies. They were called resurrectionists. This was nearly a legitimate career. Relatives would guard the body after death, make sure nobody dug it up. But still in Europe, as they, they move, they do this on occasion, they'll move cemeteries and they'll find the coffins are empty. And they'll find tunnels where people tunneled in from the side and stole the body out of the coffin. And then take them and sell them to these uh, anatomy labs who would then dissect them. Now, thinking about like school here, formal medical education was not what it is now. If you want to be a doctor, you got the cash, you're going to be a doctor. You just need to go find a place that will, will teach you and sign your little slip or whatever. So it was a lot less like School of Medicine and a lot more like Vista College or whatever. It's a, a more of a for-profit thing. You had like these people that would have like cadaver dissections in their living room. They bought a body off some dude and uh, dissecting it and charging people to watch this dissection and teaching them medicine. At some point, someone decided to cut straight to the chase. The best publicized case of this involved these two guys, Mr. Burke and Mr. Hare. Uh, actually, there's an Amazon uh, Prime show. It's called Lore, L-O-R-E. And uh, there is an episode that covers the case of Burke and Hare. They're in Scotland, Edinburgh. They have a boarding house. They have a tenant. The guy dies. Maybe he owed him money or something. Anyway, so they take his body and they sell it to this doctor who's doing these dissections. The doctor's like, where'd you find it? And they're like, it fell off a truck. And he's like, I don't really care. Here's five bucks. Have a great day. And they're like, five bucks? Hell yeah, rock on. So they go, they drink their money and they're like, too bad we don't have another cadaver. And they're like, oh, maybe we could. And so they get, go to the bar. They get somebody super drunk. Like a prostitute or a homeless dude. Somebody who was dead inside already. And probably on their way out. Maybe, maybe not. Whatever. Didn't matter to them that much. They had lured them back to their little boarding house keep getting them drunk until they passed out. When they passed out, they'd smother them. And then they'd take the body and sell it to this dude. And they, the doctor would be like, wow, that was really, really fresh. And they're like, yeah, I know. It's weird, right? We just found it. He's like, I just don't care. More money, better bodies. And if the body was damaged in any way, that's not going to work. Some sort of weird oddity about it. Nope. Less money. At some point, I mean, the doctor obviously had to know the whole time they were killing people. He never got in any trouble whatsoever, though. At some point, they caught on to this. I don't actually remember how they got caught, but it's not like they had CSI. So basically, they probably beat one of them up so severely that he finally confessed in exchange for immunity. So Mr. Hare gets off scot-free. Mr. Burke is hanged. Not only is he hanged, He's then dissected publicly. And during that dissection, they made notes dipped with a quill dipped in his blood. And the doctor doing the dissection made stuff out of his skin. To be honest, at that point, they probably should have just gone ahead and locked up the doctor doing the dissection because that guy's psychotic too. Here you see this little Burke skin pocketbook. And the caption there, a pocketbook made from the skin of William Burke after his corpse had been publicly dissected. Here is Mr. Burke's skeleton on display at Edinburgh University to serve as a warning to anyone else who might try that crap. There's a little card case made from his skin as well. Again, that'll show him. At the time, the anatomist was a lot like the executioner, except worse. If you stole a pig, they might hang you. But 
if you killed someone or, you know, 15 or 20 or 30 people, they would hang you and dissect you. Like Mr. Burke here, not only did they dissect him, they preserved his freaking skeleton for everyone to see. A fate worse than death. Again, the Amazon dramatization of this is really good and disturbing. So this became a problem. 1832, Great Britain passes the Medical Act. Basically what this did is it made it difficult to legally obtain cadavers. Screw this back alley anatomy school crap. You have no business with a dead body in your living room unless it died there. And then you should call someone. That's the rule now. You can't just handle it yourself. So it shifted dissection from these public events or back alley events or whatever into hospitals and universities. Basically, it created so much legal red tape. The only places that could afford to deal with all the legality of it were these big colleges and hospitals. And actually the Medical Act of 1832 is still in the book. And it, it uh, shaped United States law. Today, when we do cadaver dissections, like in a, um, a med school lab, cadavers are willed to the college, the willed body program. When you're at someone donated their body to science, that's what that is. You donate your body, you will it to the college. If your stereo to your brother and your car to your girlfriend and your body to Texas Tech, guns up. And then you're dissected by med students. At Tech, um, it's like 150 bucks, your family can get your ashes back in the commemorative Texas Tech urn. Or um, for nothing, uh, they cremate you and there is a plot at Rest Haven for participants in the World Body Program. I, I taught in the Gross Anatomy Lab at the Health Sciences Center for a couple of years and it's very respectful. Um, it's, it's a gift um, when you donate your body to science because the last thing that you can do is to teach the next generation about anatomy and physiology with your remains. That being said, I would never do that. One big, I'm too tall to fit on the table. Also, I just don't need that sort of scrutiny after I'm dead. So today, lots of different methods. We have cadavers. In the state of Texas, cadaver dissection is limited to medical schools. Um, but with today's equipment, we can do anatomical studies on people that are alive. We can do virtual cadaver dissection. And if this were in person, that's what we would be doing. Uh, we would be using our anatomage table, which if you haven't seen it, is this epic virtual dissection. It's a virtual cadaver dissection. It's amazing and real um, sized, it's life-sized. Um, it's just like dissecting a cadaver minus the mess. And there's an undo button. It's, it's, we'll look at videos of that later um, in the semester as we do lab stuff. And one of the big disappointments that I have with this online format is that we don't get to use this hands-on because it is a, a really, impressive uh, lab equipment. It's, it's really cool. Um, but again, we'll look at that later as we go through. Uh, if you have CT scans or MRIs of yourself, we can actually put those into the anatomage table. We'll render them back in 3D and we can dissect you. It's awesome for everybody but you. It's a little disturbing if it's you. So what we know about the body, what we know about anatomy and physiology, hundreds and hundreds of years of scientific study. Time for science. When I say that something is science, I am being specific. It is based on assumptions, methods that yield testable, reliable, objective answers. Science is a specific thing. 
It's not science-y or science-ish. It's not science sounding. It is very specific. So in order to be science, first of all, one of the major caveats of science is science is never proven, only disproven. We don't do science experiments to prove our hypotheses right. We're testing to see what would make our hypothesis wrong. If you can't falsify an idea, if there's no possible way that your idea is wrong, that's not science. Even things that, that we know are correct, it's always tentative with science because technology advances. Several hundred years ago, we knew that the nervous system controlled homeostasis in the body. Then we discovered the endocrine system and there's more to it than that. It's not just nerves, it's also hormones. We're always learning something new. And so science changes continually. It may completely falsify an old idea or it may just change it slightly. Now, some scientific ideas become more firmly ingrained as we test them and we can't make them false. There are scientific facts that are not up for uh, any sort of, of debate because we can observe them, we can see them. There's no question about it. Things like air being a gas at room temperature, it just is. But science always changes. That doesn't make it wrong. That just means that we're getting better at it. So an example of this, Bigfoot, free and a Bigfoot. First statement, there is Bigfoot. You could totally prove that, bring me Bigfoot. But I can't ever disprove that because to disprove that, I would have to check every square inch of the planet, make sure there's no Bigfoot, has to do this simultaneously. It's not feasible to do that. Second statement, Bigfoot doesn't exist. You could easily prove that statement wrong. Bring me Bigfoot. Not some sort of stupid picture of a guy in a monkey suit walking across a river or some stupid footprint. Bring me the Bigfoot if it's real. Problem solved. But I can't ever prove that. because no one's actually produced the Bigfoot. Right now, that's the prevailing idea. When you see these people that go out and they're like searching for these, these cryptids, they're not looking for something that makes their idea wrong. They're convinced that Bigfoot's real and they're looking for evidence to prove that right. That's not science. That's not how science works. Science works by we find this evidence, say this stupid footprint, and we come up with a hypothesis. Let's say we do hypothesize that it's some sort of giant ape, and then we test it. We observe. We see what else it could be. We don't look for evidence to prove ourselves right. We're not looking for confirmation. That's not science. Science is testable. We can observation. Experimentation, if you can't test it, it's not science. If you can't observe it, it's not science. So genes coding for skin pigmentation, we can do that. We can knock those genes out and see what happens. Can't test the Bermuda Triangle. Can't, right? Lots of things go through there all the time. Nothing happens. Something sinks there, Bermuda Triangle occurs. There's no way to test that. There's no way to observe it. Science is also repeatable. If the results can't be repeated, it may have been an accident. Something may have gone wrong. This is especially applicable for drug companies. What if the drug company just tested a drug once? First dude, you're like, oh, his hair grew back. 
sell it. Hair growth, 7,000. Oh, crap, it kills everybody but that guy. No, we test it lots and lots and lots and lots of times before it ever sees human trials. And then again, before it ever sees the market. Because you need repeated results. With repetition comes confidence. As we saw before with Einstein, no amount of experimentation can ever prove you right, but a single experiment can prove you wrong. And this happens on occasion where somebody comes up with an experiment and it shows that your idea is wrong or that it needs to be changed. Science is always changing. And that does lead to some difficulties with people who don't understand science. Science is public. We publish science in peer-reviewed journals. We don't publish science in books. We don't publish science in magazines. Freaking don't publish science on Facebook or Twitter. Peer-reviewed journals. And in a peer-reviewed journal, other scientists rip it apart because that's what they like to do for fun. It has to go by other scientists. And when I say that, people who understand the same field, who are also experts in the field. This is an important thing. Expertise is an important thing. There are people that know more about subjects than other people, experts. There are our infectious disease experts. They've spent their lives studying infectious diseases. Just because Someone else spent 20 minutes reading an article on Google. It doesn't put them on equal footing. Peer review means that your science is being reviewed by your peers, by people who have the knowledge that you have as well and can look at that and criticize how you did it, your methods, what happened there. It's not review by the public. It's not um, trial by popular opinion. It's peer review. So what's happened, especially now, is that the idea of science and not science is really blurry. Today, this has lots of ramifications because of our current situation in terms of the pandemic. Everybody is an expert. No, actually, they're not. I've been teaching anatomy and physiology since I was 24 years old at the university level. I have got a lot of degrees. I still do not have the expertise to tell you that what Anthony Fauci says is wrong. I, we're not on equal footing. Infectious disease, doctor, they're very, very specific and specialized. And today, because we have access to information, people have the idea that that means that we're all on this equal footing and that, that your thoughts on this are equivalent to their thoughts and that's not the case. And these very non-scientific ideas masquerade as science. And then they get caught up in popular beliefs of social media and they spread. And then people think that that's the case when it's not. Currently, one of our issues is with vaccinations. And this is a reoccurring theme. 
where people think that you're going to get COVID-19 from the vaccine. That's not the case. It's never been the case. But when that idea hit social media, it spread like wildfire, and there are people that firmly believe that. So now especially, it's super important that you understand the difference between scientific and not scientific. Things that are not science, that, are, that, that masquerade as science, we call it pseudosciences. Pseudosciences are vague and exaggerated. You can't refute their claim. Like try to tell the Bigfoot person that there's no such thing as Bigfoot. He'll tell you, prove it. You can't, as previously discussed. So he counts that as a win. Some of it's harmless. Cryptozoology, like those guys looking for Bigfoot, rock on, man. Uh, you want to go look for Bigfoot? It's fun to watch on TV. Ghost Hunters, oh yeah. Ghost Adventures, if you're watching these, Ghost Adventures is your win. Those guys are idiots and it's awesome. The thing is, is they take scientific equipment and it looks a lot like science. It's not. Just because they use scientific equipment, just because it looks like science, doesn't make it science. When it comes to medicine, anatomy and physiology, this gets dangerous. So let's do some um, some uh, questions here. Science or pseudoscience? This is psychic surgery. This is my favorite. Psychic surgery is a procedure. Um, you see Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom? It's that. The dude reaches in you. Pulls out a tumor or whatever. Here he's removing it. Tumor from this girl's belly button. It's a belly button noma. I don't know. Um, but it's magic. Like he reaches in you and he pulls it out. Oh, check it out. It's awesome. People are like, oh, I need your well. No, you're not. Nobody, how the crap was that supposed to work? Think about that for like three seconds. No. That's solid pseudoscience. It's obviously pseudoscience. It's quackery. Um, this is the comedian Andy and Kaufman. He underwent psychic, psychic surgery um, to treat lung cancer. And then he died of lung cancer. Popular right now, essential oils. The idea being that the oils can treat, prevent infection, chronic disease. This is also pseudoscience. There's no scientific evidence to show that the diffusion of those oils in the air has any effect. Aromatherapy. The oils themselves are chemicals and they, many of them do react with your body. Many people have allergic reactions. Some of them are extremely harmful to your pets. I'm not saying they're bad. I mean, somewhere I've got one that smells like mint. It's great. It makes my room smell like gum. Um, I've got another one that's cedar my wife's viciously allergic to. Sometimes they're purported to do stuff that they have no business talking about. In 2014, the FDA issued a warning that this is unusual for the FDA. Um, they threatened uh, legal action and including criminal legal action against uh, essential oil companies that were claiming they could treat Ebola. Coughing up blood, puking up your organs. You're like, it's fine, I've got thieves oil. It was, a, it was actually a scare. I, I was in Houston at the time this happened where the outbreak was and people were freaking out and it was a big deal. And, the, and there was a big fear that, that people would try to use these sorts of pseudoscientific remedies to treat the virus. And we would have 
a giant Ebola outbreak. Luckily, we did not. So why is this a thing? Well, one of the reasons is just ignorance. Not everyone understands how the body works. So the idea exists that maybe if you do something different, you can change the way your, your kidneys function or your liver functions or something like this, because you just don't know how the body works. One of them is a placebo effect. And there's nothing wrong with placebo effect if there's nothing you can do to treat the actual disease. If you've got someone who's in chronic pain and there's nothing you can do to treat it, if you give them something that's a placebo and it makes them not hurt, that's a win. But the placebo effect will screw you over if that's the effect you get when there's a real problem that's underlying that. So you have cancer and you're like, I feel much better since I started taking B12. I think the cancer's gone. Well, no, it's not. It's placebo. You, you feel better because you think you're doing something. And then there's something called regression fallacy. Regression fallacy is the idea that your actions had an effect. So you have uh, in, insomnia and you start taking some witch doctor remedy and then you don't. And you're like, oh, well, I fixed it. Maybe it fixed itself. Maybe you had nothing to do with it. But the idea that you did it is, is there and so now you're stuck with that. For some reason, people distrust conventional medicine. Often that's fair, especially when the issues aren't communicated to you well. Um, pure fear, you don't wanna have surgery. So, I mean, if you can avoid surgery by having some guy reach in you and pull out a tumor, okay. Some people can't afford it, as odd as that seems. And so they try the cheaper route or they've been told there's nothing they can do, so they're desperate. If you invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in having someone manipulate your energy fields, it's gonna be difficult for you to admit that you were wrong. There's pride involved there. And then often there's just fraud where people are ripping you off on purpose. They know they're not helping you, they just don't care. You have snake oil over here, immediate relief, good for everything. I don't even remember what was in snake oil. It treated none of those things. People get mad when you, when you talk about pseudoscience. Um, and you can believe what you want to believe. What's the hurt? Why do you have to, you have to criticize this? Currently, 20% of Americans believe that vaccines cause autism. About 37% of Americans believe the government suppresses natural cures to help pharmaceutical companies make money. So first, I'll address the vaccine autism thing. This idea was brought up by uh, Andrew Wakefield, Wakefield, anyway, um, years ago and correlated the measles vaccination, MMR, with the onset of autism. Unfortunately, he didn't. Um, actually, he made up the results. Um, his data was fraudulent. His study was fraudulent. The whole thing was fraud because he had developed his own vaccine that he wanted to sell to the government, but they had no reason to buy it from him because the old one worked fine. So he had to discredit the old one, and he did, by telling everyone it caused autism. It does not. And that study was retracted, and it, yeah, it was too late. Um, as for the government suppressing natural cures so that they can help pharmaceutical companies, if there was a natural treatment for something, pharmaceutical companies would sell that to you. Aspirin comes from a plant. They sell that to you. Lots of medications that we have are easily found in nature and they sell those to you. It's a very expensive drug that's very cheap to make. It's a liquid, it's a controlled substance. Um, 
used to treat uh, neurological condition and, and they make a fortune on it. They'll sell it to you. In fact, most of the, the vitamin companies that are owned by bigger pharmaceutical companies, if there was a way to treat something and they can make a profit on it, they would. It's not like you just go out in your backyard and start eating dandelions or whatever and fix cancer. So yeah, that's not a thing. If you could, they'd trademark dandelions and come steal them out of your yard. In the developing world, pseudoscientific ideas created the AIDS epidemic. South Africa, 30% of the population believes that witchcraft causes AIDS. 20% believe the CIA created it. And another 20% believe that condoms actually have the virus in them. So that's not helpful. About 3 million people every year die from an illness that could be prevented by a vaccine, obviously not counting COVID-19. And often people will delay treatment searching for a, a natural cure, which makes things more difficult. Especially if a legitimate treatment exists. This is really frustrating right now for people in the medical field because people that have no knowledge of medicine, infectious disease or science in general are spreading ideas that are harmful and that are making this situation worse. So before you share anything on Facebook or throw your opinion out there. Make sure that you have some legitimate knowledge of this and you're not just regurgitating what someone else said. Reading it on Facebook is not studying it or understanding it. So you're killing us because your, your true beliefs don't change facts. People are like, oh, um, I don't believe that the mask is helping anything. That's great. I don't believe that hats are real. Doesn't change anything. People still wear hats and you should still wear the stupid mask. Because science doesn't care what you believe. So how do you distinguish between like actual science and witch doctor crap. Um, first thing here, look at the source, Facebook, freaking Dr. Oz, magazines, the infomercials that come on late at night. Those are not sources. You can't believe that. Everyone on Facebook is lying to you. Everyone on Twitter is super lying to you. The next thing is the plural of anecdote is not data. You, you can read like 47 people on Facebook said that worked. Really? Did they do like a scientific study that no, it's just a bunch of idiots that are like, oh, it worked for me. How'd you measure that? That's not science. It's not research. That's not data. Medicine is science. We don't guess. The last thing is common sense. If it's too good to be true, it is. My idea here is that you will know enough about how your body works and how physiology works that you can separate these ideas. You can look at something and say, yeah, that's just stupid actually. That's not how your body works. What does this have to do? I care because at some point as a medical pra practitioner of some sort, you're probably gonna run into one of them. There's, actually that's all five of them, the oldest one standing up with a rake, like a belligerent teenager. But at some point you're probably going to see one of these fools. But, and I would appreciate it if, if you were practicing science-based medicine personal story, um, when the COVID-19 thing started, um, actually, 
um, apparently had the flu or something, but um, I went in. They wouldn't test me. And the doctor at the emergency room um, sent me to go buy elderberry syrup to treat potential COVID-19. Now this is in the very beginning and not a good call for that. And, and I, I shudder to think how many people got sent away with that instead of, I don't even know at that time what they would have done to treat it, but it was not helpful. And there's absolutely no evidence to show that that would help COVID-19. It's, you have to be careful with the information you share with others, especially once you get into the field, because then you become the expert. As a nurse or a doctor, you have that degree of expertise and authority to tell someone, here's what you should do. And you need to know that the advice you give to people is based on evidence. Once you understand how the body works, you should be able to do this. You understand how muscle cramps work. You won't tell someone to go sleep with a bar of soap under their mattress. I'm not kidding about this. This is a freaking thing. People are like, oh, you have leg cramps. Put a bar of soap under your mattress. How is that supposed to do anything? Does the soap soak up the leg cramps? What happens if you use the bar of soap after it soaks up your leg cramps? Do you get the leg cramps back? You have to throw this up away. What if somebody else uses it? Do they get the leg cramps? How do the leg cramps get through the mattress and the soap? Does it have to be a specific kind of soap? Any soap? What if the soap already has leg cramps? Could it be over full? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And people are like, well, it's stupid, but it works. No, it doesn't. That's regression fallacy. Your leg cramps went away, nothing to do with the soap. Please don't do this. Or if you do, at least let me make fun of you later. All right, on with this. So for lots of people, the hardest thing here is the words because they're Latin or Greek and hard to say and hard to spell. And in 1998, all the anatomy geeks apparently got together and uh, came up with this book with all the words. Um, proper terminology here re re uh, rejects anything that's an eponym. An eponym is a term that comes from the name of a person, like fallopian tube. Who knew that was named after somebody? And the correct term now is a uterine tube. We have several other examples of that, but that's the biggest thing. It really just standardized all the terms, so we weren't all calling it something different. For us, it's important that you spell stuff right and you say things right. Changing letters and words makes them different. Saying them wrong makes you sound stupid. And we want to avoid that if at all possible. We also use specific directional terms in anatomy, superior and inferior. And we use those a lot. Now, when you get to a clinical setting, that's all they're going to use. Here, we'll break them in slowly. This is anatomical position. In anatomical position, the big thing here is the palms are facing forward or the forearms are in the supine position. The reason that's important is because the radius and the ulna are parallel when the forearms are supinated. Pronate the arm, rotate it over so that the palm faces backwards, and the radius rotates over the ulna, and that makes it difficult to describe anatomically. We have directional planes, sagittal transverse frontal plane. We'll look at cross sections of the body. This is a sagittal section of the body dividing the body in the left and right halves. Here's a frontal section of the chest dividing into anterior and posterior. A transverse section of the head so it separates the superior from the inferior. Here's some important directional terms, ventral and dorsal, anterior and posterior. Those are all front and back. Superior and inferior is above and below. Medial means toward the middle, lateral away from the middle. Proximal, distal, proximal means closer to the attachment point. 
the shoulder is proximal to the elbow. The wrist is distal to the elbow. Superficial means closer to the surface of the body. The skin is superficial to the muscle. The muscle is deep to the skin. Left and right always refers to the patient's left and right, not yours. The Latin for left and right is sinister or dexter. You'll rarely see that but it always refers to the patient's left or right, not yours. Caudal and rostral, we don't use a whole lot. Um, ipsilateral means on the same side, contralateral on the opposite side. Visceral always means guts associated with organs and parietal is the wall of a body cavity. Specific regions of the body get their own name. By no means do I expect you to remember all of these. But as time goes by and you use them more and more, these sort of regional terms will become second nature. There are quadrants of the abdomen, left, right, upper, and lower quadrants. We also have cavities in the body, dorsal and ventral body cavities. The dorsal body cavity consists of the cranial and vertebral canal, where we find the central nervous system. The ventral body cavity, thoracic, abdominal cavity, separated by the diaphragm. So here we see the dorsal body cavity, with the cranium and the vertebral canal, the ventral body cavity with the thoracic cavity here above the diaphragm and the abdominal cavity below the diaphragm. The lungs sit in the pleural cavity. The heart sits in the pericardial cavity. This semester, we have the luxury of learning anatomy systematically. We go system by system. We'll talk about the skin, the bones, the muscles, the nerves this semester. And B2, the rest of it. If we were doing gross anatomy, we would probably do this regionally. Well, we would do all the anatomy of the arm, the head, the neck, whatever, because you're dissecting the cadaver and it's not like you can put it back together and go back later. Now there are major themes that we'll see throughout the semester. One of them is cell theory. All your physiology, all your anatomy is a result of the cells. We start any system, we'll talk about the cells first. Homeostasis, we'll talk about in just a second, sort of the goal of your physiology. And off and on, we'll be talking about evolution. A lot of your physiology and anatomy cannot be understood without considering the history, evolutionarily speaking, of how we got here. More on that when necessary. Hierarchy of structure, we start with the smallest units and we build up. And then the big overarching theme is the unity of form and function, the complementarity of form and function. All anatomy is a result of physiology and all physiology is made possible by anatomy. But let's talk about homeostasis. All the systems in your body work together to maintain a constant internal environment and we call that homeostasis. It's kind of the goal of your physiology deviate far enough from homeostasis and you'll die. When we get down to it, that's what everyone dies from is disruption of homeostasis of some sort. So how do we do it? Well, we use something called negative feedback. Negative feedback means that the product of a system inhibits that system. A great example of negative feedback is the thermostat in your house. Set it on 74 degrees. It's like, it's Lubbock, so it's like 150 degrees outside the air conditioner comes on, cold air comes out, temperature in your house goes down to 74, shuts off the thermostat. Then the temperature in your house slowly comes back up, air conditioner comes back on. That's negative feedback. The product of the system, in this case, cold air, turns off the air conditioner. When the room gets down to that temperature, the air conditioner shuts off. And then temperature goes back up and it kicks it back on. So what we get in terms of temperature of the room is this up and down curve, this wavy line. It's never a flat line. We are dynamic equilibrium. We're changing. We average on that flat line. Your body temperature works the same way. What's your body temperature? Well, 98.6, that's an average. You may take your temperature now and it may be 98.6 or it may be 99 or it may be 98. But on average, it's about 98.6. It's this up and down sort of roller coaster up where we maintain this constant internal environment. Negative feedback is always slow. It's very predictable. Negative feedback is how we maintain homeostasis. 
positive feedback is a completely different story. It's the opposite. It is not how we maintain homeostasis. And we'll save that for another day. For now, we're gonna wrap things up. And next time we're gonna talk about chemistry and it's going to suck. See you then.